What I'd like to do in the little bit of time that I'm going to spend with you today is to zero in on another place and a very particular date, um, Paris in 1913, uh, which was the height of the phenomenon called Tango Mania. So I wanted to start by um, quoting a little poem for you, and it goes like this. The tango is the dance of the devil. It is his favorite. He dances it to cool down. His wife, his daughters, and his servants cool themselves down that way. So this little verse was penned by the Parisian composer, Eric Satie, who lived from 1886 to 1925. This is a famous photo of him by Man Ray. Satie is best known for a set of piano pieces called Gymnopédie. You may think you've never heard of these pieces, but I guarantee that you have heard them in an elevator, in a dentist's office, <laughs> in a waiting room somewhere. They were sort of the original music. Um, but the poem, the tango, was part of one of Satie's lesser known works. This was a multimedia composition that I'll talk a little bit about later on uh, called Sport et Divertissement, and you see the title page for it here. It's an extraordinary and category-defying work that celebrated and cemented the relationship between music and fashion in the 20th century. Uh, in this work, the tango was just one of 20 topics that Satie tackled in expressive vignettes that really looked into the pleasures of life in pre-war Paris. Chief among these amusements, of course, was dance, and in the world of dance in 1913, tango reigned supreme. Not just a set of steps, it was an exceptional integration of appearance and everyday life, an attitude and a stance that transcended fashion. Its ripple effects were numerous, in addition to motivating the creation of a new color, a sort of burnt orange hue, which just became known as tango, the dance prompted an edict from the city's archbishop, Monsignor Ahmet, who in 1913 declared it, quote, offensive to public morals before forbidding its performance entirely. Uh, it also motivated a number of fragrances, cosmetics, um, all advertised in ways like this that had at least some little hint of this orange color in them. Uh, 1913 was, as I've said, the year that the fascination with the tango erupted into tango mania, a phenomenon so pervasive that one of the leading fashion magazines of the day, Femina, noted that it had be become impossible to, quote, read a magazine or a newspaper without seeing information about the technical aspects of the dance, its moral appearance, its worldly nature. Everyone, the reporter commented, has an opinion about the tango. So the Parisian tango was a hybrid adaptation of some of the dances that were the forerunners of what Valeria and Walter just performed for us. The tango coalesced in Buenos Aires in the 1850s following centuries of evolutions, evolution in the countryside and its outskirts. It brought with it to Paris a kind of sense of seedy eroticism, which of course appealed not only to Parisian thrill seekers, but especially to bored aristocratic women who were drawn to its central theme of dominance and submission. In cafes, dance halls, buvettes, other little boring holes around the city, Argentine dance professors, who in, in some uh, journals that tried to elevate this phenomenon, likened them to the dance masters who taught the gavotte in the Ancien Regime. Uh, these uh, Argentine dance professors were on hand to provide uh, proper instruction for the ladies who, learned, who lined up to learn the steps. Dance manuals also appeared in droves, and among the most popular of these was Max Rivera's small booklet, Le Tango et les Danses Nouvelles, published by Pierre Lafitte in 1913, which proclaimed the dance as a truly modern phenomenon, the, the representative dance of our era. 
And here's a, a, a cover from Femina showing the tango and Lafitte's um, explanation there from the pages of the magazine with, as you can see, um, instructions, illustrations outlining the steps. <clears throat> Uh, as I, I mentioned, Lafitte was not just a dance master, he was an important publisher, and he had, had in fact founded this magazine, Femina, in 1901. We see here the dang tango dancers gracing the magazine's cover, um, and in addition to the article you see there at the left, Femina ran articles on the tango all the time. Um, by 1913, the magazine was arguing that the tango was not just an important dance, but in fact that it held an important place in French society, history, and high art. It even made the case that dancing the tango had changed women's bodies. So I quote from the article on this subject, for the moment at least, a wave of suppleness has come down on our fashions and lifestyle. The orientalizing look has thrown its undulating veil on feminine shoulders, and women walk the tango. What does that mean? That there is a rapport between the dance and this new way of walking? Yes, quite simply. What then is it about this dance? So captivating, so harmonious, that it has affected not only the dances in our salons, but even our way of walking. Is there something more personal, more intimate about the tango? No answer to that question was forthcoming. Another Femina article put the tango in historical context. Again, I quote, dances follow the taste of centuries, changing like clothes and dresses. In the past, in our father's time, during the reign of panier and high elaborate coiffures, slow dances were the only thing possible and thus we had the graceful minuet, the elegance of the gavotte, and the passe-pied. Now the skirts are slit, at least at the bottom. The feet are free, and corsets have become simple belts. It is a new world. So shortly after this article appeared, um, the glance was ahead to the future and not back into the past of the panier, as the tango was likened to modern sports, Indeed, Femina deemed it, quote, the most harmonious sport of all, since after all, doesn't it work all the muscles? In the same issue of the magazine, the connection was made to the most famous dance troupe of the time, and we've heard quite a lot about them, Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, which had performed in Paris to great acclaim each year since 1909, presenting virtuosic dancers, including Anna Pavlova, Tamar Karsavina, and Vaslav Nijinsky, in works such as Petrushka, The Firebird, and here's some costumes for that, and The Afternoon of a Fawn, <clears throat> all of which created excitement in fashionable and aristocratic circles. <clears throat> Feminist critic asked, didn't the ballet russe bring the maximum beauty to our sights and renew our aesthetic canon? I know that Nijinsky is far from being a socialite dancing the tango or the turkey trot, he argued, but for an attentive observer, the two kinds of dance are linked. This photo of Nijinsky uh, in costume for Scheherazade would kind of make you wonder what he would look like doing the turkey trot, but okay. <laughs> The reviewer could not have predicted that within weeks the Ballet Russe would create two artistic scandals, one sparked by, in fact, a, a sports-themed ballet, Je, with music by Claude Debussy, and costumes by um, Jean Paquin, one of the top Parisian couturiers of the time, and a second, far more uh, well-known um, uh, riot and scandal that erupted at the premiere of the Rite of Spring with music by Igor Stravinsky, wearing the formal wear, and costumes and decors by the Russian anthropologist Nikolai Rorik, who is not wearing tails. <laughs> well, uh, and you see uh, 
here are some costumes and uh, works designed for a costume from the Rite of Spring. Well, feminist writers argued for the tango's importance in French culture, <clears throat> its illustrators captured the streamlined silhouettes and sleek hairdos of the dancers and documented what was known at the time as the thé dansant, or the tango tea, the milieu of choice for tango crazed socialites. Again, quoting from Femina, describing this phenomenon, they dance, they dance everywhere, at every hour, on any occasion, morning and night, on ice or during skating parties. In the past, tea time marked a pause in this activity. It was the last refuge. Now chatter and amusing gossip have disappeared. In the most rarefied establishments, the tables are pushed against the wall and the orchestra, abandoning its fantasies on Tosca or La Boheme, purrs instead the grizzly bear or the turkey trot, tangos and maxises that are far more or less Brazilian. Today's elegante, topped off with feathers and aigrettes, muffs in hands, flowers at the bust line, turn on the floor and forget the now defunct saint cassette, the hour of the boudoir of dreams, l'heure exquise. <clears throat> By the end of 1913, tango mania had reached even the Académie Française, where novelist and playwright Jean Richepin extolled the social, political, historical, and cultural dimensions of the dance at the annual meeting of all five branches of the Institut. This is a caricature of Richepin there a, in his poetic mode and uh, an image from one of his plays, Le Minaret. Richepin had entered the Academy in 1909 and had great success with this play, Le Minaret, in 1913, which, as you can see, featured orientalizing costumes by Paul Poiret. In the lecture he gave on the tango at the academy, he traced the origins of the dance all the way back to the athletic games of the Greeks. And he made a case for the tango as an inevitable part of history and a harbinger of a future marked with movement and excitement. He even followed contemporaries inciting the daredevil, daredevil aviator Adolphe Pigou, who had perfected the aerial loop right around this time. Um, he called Pego the practitioner of le tango aérien. <laughs> and you see there the, the loop the loop uh, illustrated. This is a German postcard, but I, you know, the photo of Pego is just too good to miss there. And then this from another publication um, showing uh, similar kinds of loops in a description of dancing the tango steps and showing the, the airplane movement. Um, Richepin came down from the sky a little bit to talk about something that was probably closer to his heart, previewing his new play, Le Tango, um, which is a four-act comedy that starred two of the most famous Parisian actresses of the day, Yves de la Valliere and Elise Fournier, popularly known as Mademoiselle Spinelli. Um, this is uh, some uh, magazine pieces on this uh, new uh, comedy, including an article about the, the play itself by Richepin and his wife. And this is a great photo of Spinelli and Yves Lavalier in costume for the production with Richepin and his wife sitting there checking it all out and making sure that they like the costumes. Uh, Richepin summed up the whole subject of the tango for the Institute as follows. For us, the tango is not just a dance. It is above all a symbol, the symbol of the nouvelle mode, both for today and for tomorrow. The tango lover is certainly not the man who loves to dance. My wife and I consider him for what he is, a modern man, a man of 1913, who is consumed by the need to be active, to live, to refresh himself every day in all areas of the human spirit, the latest novelty. 
So, as you might expect, this vogue for the tango quickly spread from Paris to New York and to other U.S. cities, thanks in no part to American fashion magazines. One of the most important of these was Vanity Fair, launched by Condé Nast just as the tango reached its peak of popularity. Nast published a regular column called The Paris Mode, which naturally linked fashion in the city of light to the mania for dancing. And the tango tees, the tés dansant, were a particular focus of Nast's interest. Uh, as everything in Paris is exemplified in or leaves its mark on clothes, he had his commenter in Vanity Fair wrote, right? So the tango tees have necessitated the creation of new styles of dress, ones that could be worn on afternoons and yet not be too warm for dancing. Thus we have the tango visite, or semi-evening gown with a short skirt and oh, so transparent, a bodice, a whisper, a breath of tulle, the filmiest, filmiest lace loose enough to accommodate the sinuous steps of the dance, yet suggestively revealing the body, um, the new tango gown set a tone for movement in dress that shifted away from tailored formality and toward a coquettish delicacy. The styles illustrated in Vanity Fair over and over um, exemplified this, and there's a particularly good one, which unfortunately I don't have an image of, called What You Shall Wear to the Tango Tees. Um, but what was described was a gown elaborately beaded with turquoises, which would clearly be seen to advantage when the wearer was engaged in the motions and the emotions of the dance. That's how Vanity Fair summed it up. The tango tees caught the imagination of composers and producers of sheet music. Here are just two examples that give you some sense of the style associated with the tango. Um, and also, again, with this pervasive use of the color orange. And this rather famous image by the caricaturist Sam, also from 1913, uh, gives you a glimpse. So by the end of this year, the year 1913, the tango tees and the gowns they had inspired were so formally identified with French style that there was really no distinction. Again, quoting from Vanity Fair and its critic, an eternal tango is how a witty American epitomizes the life of the French elegant of today, and very accurately, too. Does the Parisian play bridge? Oh no, she tangos. Does she ride, drive, or pursue any of her accustomed pastimes? Indeed, she does not. She tangos. She tangos afternoon, evening, and night until the wee small hours have long passed when she hides at home for a brief beauty sleep so that she may be up and going again and again. Paris is entering upon a period of luxury and elegance unequaled since the 18th century. One assumes that's thanks to the tango and the energetic Parisian who keeps it all going. By the beginning of 1914, then, the tango's place was secure in fashion and in society, on stage and even in intellectual circles. But the dance was not really accepted in the realm of so-called serious music. That sheet music that we saw was for popular use and home parlor uh, performance. And this brings me back to Eric Satie and this work I mentioned at the top of my talk, Spore et Divertissement. The work itself um, is very unusual. It is an oversized score measuring about 17 by 17 inches. And in essence, it was a kind of musical adaptation of a fashion magazine, complete with up-to-date illustrations depicting the latest style. This is the table of contents for the work, and you see that it includes 20 topics, which each of which was developed into a kind of multimedia composition, and each one of which describes a pastime or diversion of contemporary Parisian society. You see these range from real things, real sports like yachting and le tennis, to, th to things that are more like social sports, like flirt and le tango. 
um, or even engaging in a picnic. Each subject in the work is represented by a title page with a small design encapsulating the topic. This is ocean swimming. The reverse side of this page contains Satie's score, which combines music and texts. So this is the one for um, uh, swinging. Um, and uh, you can see that also that this isn't uh, in any way a conventional printed score. It's done in Satie's own hand-drawn calligraphy. Um, you also note that there's a little text in between the staves of the musical score. This is not meant to be sung. Um, there's a varied opinion on whether it's supposed to even be pronounced at all. My, my opinion is that this was meant for a very intimate performance and where people were gathered around the piano and would have been looking over the shoulder of the pianist to really be able to read this, but that's up for debate. Um, and the page facing this score in the album, uh, sadly this isn't a very good um, image, but you get the sense it uh, includes a full page color reproduction of the topic. Uh, even the work's title, Sport et Divertissement, originates in the fashion milieu. That phrase was widely used um, as a slogan to attract upscale tourists to trendy resorts, and it appeared in advertisements in the same fashion magazines that wrote all the time about the tango. This work paired Eric Satie with an artist named Charles Martin. At the time, he was one of the leading fashion illustrators in Paris, although he's largely been forgotten now. Martin was a bon vivant, based primarily at the luxurious and trend-setting French fashion magazine, La Gazette du Bon Ton. This magazine was published by a, a visionary man named Lucien Vogel, and you see here the cover of it and its announcement that it was dedicated to arts, fashions, and frivolities. Um, we have copies of this in our special collections upstairs if you're interested in it. We also have a copy of the album, Sport et Divertissement. But if you hold it in your hands, you'll see that it's really like a deluxe book printed on very fine paper and illustrated with pochoir plates, not um, mechanically reproduced illustrations. Um, Martin produced many, many illustrations for this magazine, and here are just two examples of his work for the Gazette du Bon Ton. Satie's entree into this circle was provided by an artist, Valentine Gross, who you see there, um, with um, Jean Hugo and Rene Radichouet. Um, Gross and Satie, um, probably met in 1913. Gross at that time was working for the Gazette du Bon Ton. She was one of the very few female illustrators working there. And she had also uh, achieved a bit of notoriety um, for the sketches she did on the spot during rehearsals of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring with the Ballet Russe. And those illustrations are at the far side. This is an illustration that she did for the Gazette du Bon Ton of a Ballet Russe work and of the ballerina Tamara Karsavina. Um, Satie, shortly after meeting her, was referring to her as, quote, one of the good ones and dedicating compositions to her. Gross introduced Satie to Vogel, and in 1914, the publisher offered him the commission for this work, Sport et Divertissement, which was envisioned from the outset as an extension of the magazine, the Gazette du Bon Ton. Satie set to work on the project straight away, completing the entire composition between March and mid-May 1914. Martin likewise completed his illustrations that spring, creating a series of black and white line drawings that convey a sense of cutting edge pre-war fashion, and in particular, uh, circle back to Paul Poiret's orientalizing designs. So Spore et Divertissement, the entire album, was ready to print by the summer, but once the war broke out at that time, it was left on the shelf where it sat until after the armistice. When the publication finally became 
plausible or possible, Martin decided he needed to revise all of the plates, updating them to capture the look of the new fashions of the early 20s, and to reflect the latest style in the visual arts in that period, which was Cubism. The two sets of illustrations offer a unique perspective on the dramatic change in style and taste that occurred during the First World War, illuminating significant social and cultural shifts that marked the period. I want to say just a quick word about each of these components. Um, Satie was not a tango maniac. In fact, he commented ironically on the dance in this work. Um, you see he has a smirking little aside there in his title. He called it Le Tango Perpetuel, the never-ending tango. And he put a repeat sign down there at the bottom, along with one at the top, to suggest that you just play it on and on and on and on and on. I have to find my right page. Um, he also included a a directive to the performer up there under the first repeat side saying that the piece was to be played moderately and with great boredom. <laughs> the music itself is a tame rendition of the dance, nothing like what we heard earlier. Um, it softens the tango's characteristic rhythmic pattern and the entire piece is to be played at the same extreme dynamic level, pianissimo, as quietly as possible. The relentless presence of the dance is conveyed by the, the repeat sign, as I said, and the diabolical connection that Satie alluded to in the text I started with, the tango is the dance of the devil, is also treated humorously as the composer builds the entire piece around um, an interval, a musical interview, interval called the tritone, known as the diabolus in musica, the devil in music. Um, in total, as a musical critique and social observation, this tiny two-minute piece is ingenious. And I want to just play it for you. Okay. So that would go on for some time. That is Maria Lebec playing, and um, maybe she just can't play in a way that makes her seem bored. She's such a lively performer. Um, but uh, that gives you at least a little flavor of Satie's approach to this. Um, Martin um, was not bored by the tango at all when he first took it up in 1913. So this is his original illustration. You can see that it evokes the tango's Argentine roots very clearly. Um, the swarthy male dancer up front wears spurs, chaps, a cape, and a hat, as well as a gun on his belt. Uh, two Argentine musicians, one assumes, simply attired, bend over their instruments in the back, and that they are a guitar and another stringed instrument that is probably a banjo. This group contrasts dramatically with the group at right, which includes the female dancers, dancer and a group of onlookers. This group is elegantly dressed, the women in gowns that could have been plucked directly from Poiret's atelier, they're all sipping champagne, and they look on as the woman bends to the lead of her seemingly dangerous partner, uh, probably one of those tango instructors of the tango tees. The link between the fashion press and sport et divertissement is further confirmed by the fact that this same illustration was reproduced in the June 1914 issue of Vogue magazine, with a caption noting that Martin brought, quote, the native tango booted, spurred, and with hip armament into play in a Paris restaurant, creating for the ladies present a delicious horror. By the time that Martin revised the image in 1922, obsessive tango mania was a thing of the past. The dance, though, remained popular in part because of its representation in the 1921 silent film, The Four Horsemen, which catapulted Rudolf Valentino to stardom. While the film's historicizing portrayal of the dance was still seamy, in practice, the dance had become stylized, and Martin's plate seen here for sport et divertissement reflects this transformation 
presenting two sophisticated and decidedly non-exotic couples engaged in a highly refined version of the tango. The erotic sensibility that permeated the or original illustration is missing. Postures erect, arms held high, these dancers are marked by their detachment from one another rather than by an intense embrace. And their body positions and blasé facial expressions suggest boredom rather than excitement. Heightening the sense of society chic, the Argentine band has been replaced by a clean-cut American jazz trio consisting of a pianist, a black drummer, and a vocalist, suggesting that the heat of the tango had dissipated and the truly stylish had moved on to newer steps. So that's a little glimpse at 1913 and the tango. Um, I'd like to bring Valeria out once again to broaden out our picture and say a few things on her own. So welcome Thank back. You. First, I want to say thank you to Dean Mary Davis and to Museum Director Valerie Steele for inviting me here today to speak about San Juanit's connection to fashion. And thank you for taking time this afternoon to attend. So as for tango and fashion, and I will be brief, the attire of tango is intimately connected to its history and themes. Tango is traditionally a dance where a man dances with a woman close embrace, and he leads. And it arose in Buenos Aires where uh, gauchos, blacks, and immigrants shuffled in at the turn of the 20th century. This place to the outskirts of the poor neighborhoods and thrown into a lawless mix where uh, the population at that point was doubled, the immigrants doubled the nationals. And also another interesting information is that by some accounts, men outnumber women three or four to one. So in Argentina, um, tango started to be danced in the courtyards of the tenements, which are conventitious in the streets and in the brothels. The dance became a way for men to compete over women's attention. From the beginning, it was an improvised dance with sudden cuts, falls, changes of direction, and pace. Tango refused to adopt any definite steps or counts. Men developed pride in being skillful leaders, and pride was an important matter for the compadritos, who are the men of Argentina who made the tango. Tango came to symbolize the compadritos' bravery and dominance, and also was a sign of social rank, and the worst fear of the compadritos was to be ridiculed. But tango lyrics point to a different direction. Most tango lyrics reflect the compadritos' romantic failures. Women, though still inferior in, uh, by norms of society in, in their place, experience in reality a new sense of power because being greatly outnumbered by men, they got to choose who they wanted to be with. The typical tango lyric is the lament of a man for losing a woman over another man, usually a richer one. So tango is also dark. Enrique Santos Isepolos, which is an Argentine composer and dramaturg, once described tango as un pensamiento triste que se baila, a sad thought made into a dance. Tango dances, dancers frequently wear black. In the dance, the role of men and women are completely distinct. And that is absolutely represented in our fashion. If relations between men and women can be described as war between the sexes, we could say that in tango we dress for battle. <laughs> men wore suits with padded shoulders to look more powerful. They wore hats which shielded their eyes. Their pants were often striped to better show the movement of, of their legs. And they didn't have cuffs because they were afraid that the women's heel were going to be trapped in them, and still I have experience, so I know it's better if they don't wear cuffs. <laughs> it is said that the traditional lengue, which is the white handkerchief the compadritos wore around their neck, was there to disguise the not so new colors of their shirts. Also, they used to carry a handkerchief, which they placed in their left hand, so that the women's, uh, their sweat wouldn't be felt by the women's right hand. Women's clothes play with the alternation of hiding 
and revealing, like our tango walk, which requires us to collect the legs and quickly reach from inside and collect again. I see the deep slit and the high heels as the epitome of femininity as threat. It always makes me laugh that a stiletto was originally a word for a knife that became the women's heel. But heels also change the silhouette of a woman's body by accentuating her curves. And most importantly for the dance, they make us quicker because we perch forward, ready for everything and anything. So much of what is intriguing and powerful about tango is what is hinted at. And like ballet or modern dance, tango is not going to display too much of our body. A tango skirt is never a mini skirt. For a female dancer, her front is her back. And so tango dresses are to be examined, examined from behind. Finally, tango also requires an element of restraint. For a man and a woman dancing chest to chest in close embrace requires some reserve. The dance is just not possible if one yields completely. The mystery lies in the balance in which both yield to each other and yet become stronger on their own axis. That sense of formality and restraint is reflected in the tango attire. So now I want to welcome to the dance floor Walter Perez, which is a man who certainly has a sense of style. Thank you. We have um, some time for questions. If you have questions for any of us, we'll be happy to take them. Maybe these guys would like to catch their breath for a second. <laughs> Anyone? Mary, I wonder if you could say something about the rise of the tango corset and the significance of the tango in the transition away from boned corsets to girdles and brassieres. Well, Val, you know way more about that than I do. <laughs> but what, um, what I can say is that the, the tango played a key role in shifting the, the notion of a, a woman's body and the upper part of a woman's body, its need to be more responsive, its need to be freer. Um, and um, so undergarments, corsets were adopted to, to um, meet that need. But uh, again, I, I would defer to you on that, on that topic. It was a, a, an important moment overall in women's fashions, not just because of that freeing of the, the bus line or reshaping of the bus line, but also in terms I mentioned of the slit in the back of the skirt to, to free the legs more. Oh, I'm, who else? I'm from Argentina. Uh, this is it worse? Yeah. And also want to thank Valerie Steele for getting through all of her uh, lectures for this absolutely wonderful uh, gift and treasure to us all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions for Mary. I was really intrigued by what you described as this sort of bored housewife phenomenon. And instead of reading Fifty Shades of Grey, they went decided to go and take up tango. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about that, this idea of boredom and then doing something a little bit subversive and sort of what sort of role did that have with the women's movement and everything? It's a, that's a really good question and a very big question. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you find or that I found in the course of my research was that people lamented this loss of quiet time and um, a, a time for ladies to get together and just talk or um, in some cases to go riding. I've come across long um, discussions about that, that now no one's going to the Bois de Boulogne to ride. There's a, you know, there was always a convention of doing that in the morning um, but apparently also uh, it was practiced in the afternoons and the, the tango tees pushed that out of the scene too. So, I mean, if you think about it, the, the option of sitting somewhere, taking tea with your friends in your tea gown um, in a quiet salon and talking about literature or playing a card game versus 
getting dressed up in something racy and going to uh, some little, you know, some little cafe or, or a cabaret or something and being able to dance and drink champagne and um, have a couple of hours before your evening started where you were um, essentially having a really good time. Um, it seems like it would be pretty appealing. Um, the larger question about feminism and, and um, liberating women, I think that gets quite complicated by the way that the First World War enters into the picture. So by the time you come out on the other end of that, the scene is, is completely different. And the tango tees as a phenomenon largely disappeared during um, World War I. They came back, but... Anybody else for our dancers? Yeah, the dance evolved, and in the beginning, so I think I also want to make the distinction between what happened in Europe and in Argentina. So Europe took a flair, a flavor of what they saw in Argentina and developed it further into what became the ballroom tango, right? Which is almost like you cannot recognize the, the familiarity too much. But in Argentina, it went from very poor neighborhoods with a black influence and also with a sense of something new that they were doing. Because also in my research, what I, what I found is that they really had a sense that they, they didn't like, they started with the habanera and the chotis and all of that, but the music didn't, didn't play for what they were doing. It's almost like the dance pushed the music because they were doing all these sudden changes and all these more enclosed and more crouched. So in the beginning, the dance was a little bit more crouchy forward. And from the beginning was very chest to chest, which was a scandalous part of that. What happened, like, like the big era of tango was the 40s. And then, it, so there was, the 20s was, but then, so there's the old Guardia Vieja and Guardia Nueva. We, we will just say that the 40s, like the, the time where Tangos became orchestrated. So tango, after it was successful in Paris, there was a new recognition in Argentina. I think also linking with women and stuff, um, the fact that it was associated with brothels made a big part of the society, uh, mostly the women of middle class, stay completely out. And then, uh, but it also was something in the street. So the neighborhoods, the small clubs, where the family went all together with kids, with the grandmother, every, like it started to be more of a familiar thing. And the orchestra started to make a lot of money. And so it became a business. With all of that, the salons changed. So they, then they started to have good floors, wooden floors, not any more patios, so the footwork changes. Because now they can pivot better. Now there's more etiquette. So there's a lot. There is a good side of more investigation on the dance. Turns start to happen, like the man start to do turns, which are called molinete, we still dance today. And the, the dance became more sophisticated into its analytical development. Like it really, like now we can do this to the right, we can do it to the left, we can reverse the roles, we can try it with the, the other front, front to back, you know. And then shows, it was more commercial, so trying to look for the flair. But what was most important to me is that there was a sense by the 40s that this was something happening down there. Argentina and Uruguay took hold of it. And they really brought it to a new level and kept developed, developing. And today, I'm from Argentina, but I don't live there. Every time I go, I'm fascinated because in any little, every neighborhood dances differently. Every little cafe has their own thing going, you know, so it's like the dance keeps alive. And I forgot your question. I don't know if I answered too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious, when you were doing your research, did you find a lot of different publications talking about tango in Paris in 1913? Or was it more, I know the person who's the direct publisher was sort of promoting it. Yeah, um, it's everywhere. It's, it is in theatrical magazines, it's in women's magazines, it's in the newspaper, it is in intellectual journals. It's hard, to, it really actually is hard to find some, <laughs> some sector of the publishing world that doesn't care about the tango. Well, thank you. All of you were amazing. You. It was such a great presentation. Thanks. Thanks.
you said everything I wanted to say. Um, I think the, um, the concept of the teas in Paris, when it was reintroduced, the tango in Argentina, it turned into, as you said, all the neighborhoods with, I think they're called tango clubs or whatever. They're during the day, people dress, not as elaborate, but people do dress. And it's everywhere. Even the children tell you about it. Did you, you know, if you're a tourist, did you go to the tango club? It's everywhere in Argentina. Well, uh, then it happened the 60s, the 70s, and parents like man, mine completely were like, oh, no, tango, so much, oh, my God. You know, like, snob about it. And they were looking at other currents uh, that of the 60s. And so rock and roll became big again. And so it, in my city, when I started to dance, so the tango went up and down. Very popular, dictatorship down, nationalist popular, then down, then other currents, you know, so it has been, but there's also always the uh, undercurrents that kept it. So when I started to dance, it was like, what is this? You know, it was like getting into a dark alley that I wasn't introduced to openly. I was kind of sneaking in and it was at night and me with my dance studies all the time, you know, at, on time in the morning and then going at night and seeing all this, you know, was attractive, I have to say, it stayed in my mind. <laughs> but it, so depending on, depending on the times and not for everybody, for my family, it wasn't something that we would do in the clubs, but many families went on to the club they do sports, they drink something, they eat something, then they go home, change, and come back to the same spot to dance with each other, to the entire neighborhood, and that's beautiful. Unfortunately, I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. well, about you? Thank you. Thank you.